Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Stories Inc. channel and our next LinkedIn learning session. I'm really looking forward to what we're talking about today, talking about what works and what doesn't work in employee storytelling. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Jill, I'm a partner at Stories Inc. and your host for today. And like always, we have Lauren down in the comments giving you tips, resources, answering your questions, anything you need to know. And we always love to hear from you too. So throughout the session, please feel free to chime in, throw in your own employee storytelling tips so we can all learn from each other today too. So I am joined with uh, Doyle and Taylor, two of my colleagues today, and we're gonna have them pop in and out throughout the session. So I'm gonna bring Doyle in as our first guest. Hi, Doyle. Hey, Jill. Um, so Doyle, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do here at Stories? Yeah, um, my name is Doyle Maurer and I'm the creative director here at Stories Incorporated. My job is mostly to take everything that's discussed on the front end of a project to make sure it translates in the actual creative products that we deliver at the end. Yeah, cool. So you're going to help us with our first two mistakes. So today we're talking about the four mistakes we make in employee storytelling and how we're going to fix them. And so we hear this all the time as we get started with projects of we don't want another talking head video. But when you use employees in your videos, you're probably going to have to have people talking, right? So Doyle, how do we get comfortable with the idea that a substantive, meaningful culture video is going to have people talking in it? Yeah, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that the power of a great employer brand video is in the storytelling. So your audience will want to watch a talking head video, but only if it's done well and it captures their interest. Uh, that, need, that means you need to focus on actual storytelling, captivating visuals, and a hook that draws your audience in from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. And we've been doing this work with employee storytelling for almost 12 years now. And we've seen a lot of things, the things that do work, the things that don't work. And we are not ashamed to say that we've probably made things in the past that don't work too. So today we're going to share these four mistakes, what we see in employee storytelling and how we can fix them. So Doyle, without further ado, what's mistake number one? Yeah. So mistake number one is, and this is something I say all the time, but if you try to talk to everyone, you'll end up talking to no one. Um, so the first mistake is not making content for your audience, but making it just for yourself and your company instead. Um, we all want something that resonates with our candidates and team members, but we can miss a few important steps. The, the first is identifying who our actual audience is, which isn't everyone and probably isn't just your CEO. Um, and then it's understanding what they care about and kind of what makes them tick. And then the last thing is your message should align with them to be specific to who they are and what they specifically care about. Yeah. Um, one other quick tip I would give is it's easy to get excited about an idea that you have for your videos, but it's important to remember to take a step back and think about how could I make this more informative or more entertaining for my audience. Yes, all good tips. And I love this concept or this idea of that if you're making this for everyone, you're actually making it for no one. So. You know, I have said on the other side, though, where I've been a person internally shepherding a video through approval processes. And, you know, you have a lot of stakeholders that you need and want to be involved in the review process and the approval process. So my tip here is just to make sure when you're sending things through to different stakeholders that they really have an understanding of who the audience is. It's probably not them, but we want them to be involved and to see the content, too. So making sure that they know who the audience is as they're reviewing as well. OK, that was mistake number one. On to mistake number two. So this mistake is the idea of not having a creative direction in mind before filming. And to be honest, this is something that we noticed was missing in our work. You know, a lot of our work is really um, heavily relies on organic story discovery, not a big scripted production, but we found this was a, a, a gap in what we were doing. So now the creative discovery process is a step in every part of a, of a project we work on. And as a creative director, Doyle, you live and breathe this every day. So what mistakes are people making in the creative direction or creative discovery process and how can we alleviate them? Yeah, so the first one is not having a tone or a feel in mind before filming. Uh, that can result in a product that people just don't love. Um, and while you don't need to have everything pre-planned to a T, it's helpful to have something in mind so that you and your filming partners are aligned when you go into the day. Yeah. Um, outside of knowing your company's brain guidelines, you should decide what emotions you're trying to evoke from your audience. Do you want them to feel excited? Do you want them to feel pumped up? Um, instead, should they feel a little more thoughtful and inspired? Video works well because it works on a logical and an emotional level. So it's just important to remember to capture the emotions as well as the logic. 
Yes, emotions are key. Yeah. And if someone is new in all of this and they're starting their first storytelling video project, what are some things they should think through as it comes to creative direction? Yeah, and thinking through it on the front end is a really important piece of this. Um, when thinking through the creative direction for a project, there's kind of a list of things. Um, first, it would be, what are the goals for the project? Who are you speaking to? What problems and desires does that audience have? And then how can you bridge the gap between their problem and their desire? Yeah. And then the last thing is just, what do you want them to do after watching your video? Yeah, so thinking through all of those things in the front end can help you figure out that sort of tone or feel or direction that you want to take. And Doyle, I know that when you do this with a lot of our clients, you find it really helpful to share examples of videos to help them really figure out like what it is they want and even more importantly, what they don't want in a video. So is there anything else you'd recommend to finding a creative direction you like or something that meshes with your company's brand? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's a great point to say what you like and what you don't like. Um, this is a creative process that's easier to define when you have specific examples. Sometimes words can get lost in translation. So a few things I'd recommend are, um, first look, at, look back at any past video projects you've worked on and consider what you like and what you don't like. Be specific and try to break it down into individual elements like the music, the story, the visuals. Uh, the next thing is to look at what your competitors are creating and think about what you wish they said that they didn't. Um, if you're wanting it, there's a good chance that your audience wants it too. And then the last thing is just to remember that it's ongoing and it's iterative. Uh, we keep a creative inspiration file of all the videos we like from different brands and our own brand. So there's always examples to reference and pull from when we need to solve a problem. Yeah, those are all great tips. And I love the one about if you're wondering or wanting more from a video, your audience probably does too. And so really thinking through that as you watch employee story videos or culture videos, like what are the missing pieces that you could help fill in? Love it. All yeah, right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Doyle. We're going to see you back in a bit. Um, we're going to bring Taylor into the conversation now for our next two mistakes. So see you soon, Doyle. All right. See you soon. Hi, Taylor. Hey, Jill. All right. We've got Taylor Howard joining us for our next two mistakes. Taylor, tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump in. Yeah. So I'm a content strategist here at Stories. And what that means is I'm the one interviewing storytellers. And then I help translate that, whether visually through video, social cuts, or through blog posts as well. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Tell us what's mistake number three. So mistake number three is only sharing platitudes or testimonials in videos instead of sharing genuine stories. And we all talk about this all the time because it actually is really hard to do. Um, as someone who's leading a content project, you do have a lot of stakeholders to please. But I think it's really important to note to, and to go back to mistake number one, remembering that you're talking to a content for a specific audience, not your internal stakeholders. Yeah. So when we say a platitude or a testimonial, what do those sound like, Taylor? There are things that we hear over and over in videos. I'm thinking of, it feels like family. I can bring my whole self to work. We're supported by leadership. Our work is really innovative. And um, although those are really great things to say about a company, that's very true. Um, not having real stories to back that up does mean that some of the comments that we hear could be from any company. It's not really unique to the specific company. Yeah, and this one is actually really hard to get past because we often want messages conveyed in our content. You know, we want people to feel like it's a comfortable place to be, that they can be themselves and show up as themselves. But we do miss creating that real connection with our audience if we don't have a story for them to remember. So we have a really great example of employee storytelling from Caterpillar that we wanted to share related to this. And so as you watch it, you could think about the platitude or testimonial for this kind of story would be something like, Caterpillar supports its people or it supports the veteran community. Um, but here's the story of what that actually looks like in real life. Um, so give me a second here to tee that up. In 2021, I unfortunately got a phone call sitting in Las Vegas that um, my father had passed away. And so 
when your ch- life changes like that, literally overnight, um, it changes your perspective over uh, over your life. My dad, from day one, visited every single military base I was at. He was, like I tell people, the shoulders that I needed to stand on when, when being a single mom was hard. Um, so when I lost him, it was like losing the security I had. And I thought, if I feel like this, I can't imagine the way my daughter feels when mommy has to go to training or when a deployment comes back up, because that happens, I've already been there. So when a deployment comes back up or I have to leave her again, how does that make her feel? And so I decided to leave the military because ultimately it came down to what is right for my daughter. what is right for the way I know that she should be raised and what ultimately I needed at that time. And it was to be there for my kid and know that I wasn't gonna leave her, especially at a time when neither one of us knew what to do. I was out at Creech Air Force Base and they had a great education office out there that ended up telling me about the skill bridge program that the DOD is offering to service members now, which is a up to six month internship at the end of your enlistment. And so it's hard for us to just come up to the end of our career and know what is on the other side. And so when you're coming out, the loss of purpose is something that we struggle with. That in- All right, this is a long video, um, but there's a lot in there about um, Katie's story and eventually brings Caterpillar into the story. But Taylor, you know, what works for you in a video like that? Just going back to Doyle's note, something I think of initially is the tone, the music selection, the pacing of the video, letting some of her sound bites breathe a little bit. I think that was probably my favorite part. I actually did watch the whole, I ended up watching the whole video and just the way they articulate um, her story and also weaving in her dad and her daughter, I think it was very compelling. But those are the things that really stand out to me. Yeah, great. And I know Lauren's going to drop a link to the full video um, in the chat so you can go ahead and watch that. But we are also in talks with the Caterpillar team to hopefully have them on a future session to hear more about their approach to storytelling and the results to the content they've created. So stay tuned. Okay, so we're on to number four already. Taylor, what is the fourth mistake we see? So the last mistake is over planning and I'm an over planner, so I totally get it. Um, but it's important to remember that as employers st- employing your storytelling project that involves real people and real experiences. So things aren't going to always go exactly as you expect it. I think it's really important to go into a project with an open mind and anticipating that there will be stories uncovered that you couldn't have planned for and you don't want to waste them. Yeah, this is such a good point. The type A planning, I'm a type A person, you know, that, you know, helps in creating the foundation for a successful day of employee interviews, but we sometimes need to push that tendency aside when we actually get into the stories. That is totally true. When you think about it, we, when we do an interview day or a filming day, we're often getting about eight storytellers for 20 to 25 minutes each. So that really translates to more than 200 minutes of footage to use. And not everything that everyone says will necessarily be usable, but there are so many times that we're passing up the opportunity to tell a story because it doesn't 100% align into the themes um, that a client selected before the interviews. Yeah. So how do we get around this? How do we balance this idea of we want to have some pre-planning down, we want to know where we're headed, but we want to leave some room for flexibility too. Like, How could we do that? Yeah. I think there should always be a, a deliverable or two that's not necessarily prescribed going into an interview day. And this will give you room to use a great story that surfaces that isn't maybe necessarily aligned with the topic that you had in mind. And we uncover so many amazing stories. And it's really sad when some of them don't even see the light of day. And oftentimes, these stories are ones that mean the most to a storyteller, too, because it's something that's really near and dear to their heart. Yeah, so true. And I know, Taylor, we've got an example of a story from one of your products. Do you want to tee it up and then we can watch a quick clip from it? 
Yeah, this is from a client from last year and um, we covered culture with this company, but this one really stood out to me. Great. All right, we're going to watch about a minute, a minute and a half of this clip. It's the people that are Davidson. It's their care for each other. In the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we had a lot of wildfires that broke out. The wildfires actually entered the city right at our property because we sit up on top of a knoll. We had probably 15 to 16 team members that lost everything. Their children's Christmas presents, their clothes, their dishes, their homes, their livelihood because they couldn't come back to work. The call came in from Davidson. What do you need? Are you guys okay? What can we do to help? All of a sudden, we started getting shipments from every Davidson property around the country. We had clothes, we had kitchenware, we had everything you could imagine that you don't even think about that you've lost that you need on a daily basis. We had the kids write their letter of what they wanted for Christmas every single item from computers to bikes to clothes to toys the people at davidson purchased those items they wrapped those items and they drove them four hours up to gatlinburg and delivered them to our families that to me is what davidson's all about i think she's tearing up a little and i'm tearing up a little like yeah wow and so taylor was that a story that did you expect it to get out of a day of interviews? Not at all. Um, she was absolutely amazing. I appreciated her vulnerability and transparency, and it was so near and dear to her. And I just appreciate it for her being so candid about it. So no, to answer your question, I did not anticipate that coming out of the interview. Yeah. And the pictures of the team members with the gifts and their families, it just really brings the story to life and you feel it emotionally. So I love that. I think there's another aspect of flexibility here too, or um, being open-minded. And that's what we see with projects often is that we create one piece of content, you create a video and it gets used just as that one video. But each asset you make, you should really have at least four or five other ways that you can use each piece of content. So after you've got everything created, it's really important to be open-minded about how else can I use this? Can I make the video that I have shorter and as a social clip? Can I write an accompanying blog post? Can I create a social graphic with a story and a quote from it? Um, so I think there's so many ways to reuse reuse pieces of content. And so it's this idea of, we well, talked about Taylor being flexible around the stories you use or what you get, but also in how you use them. So I do think um, our perspective on all this is that we think one day of filming should give you enough content to use for a half of year, a year or more. So there's so much you can get out of an interview day if you're flexible and open-minded. So, all right. Thank you, Doyle. Let's bring Doyle back. Or thank you, Taylor. Let's bring Doyle back in. Um, hello, Doyle. Hello. Hi. Okay. That was so great, Taylor. Thank you. Yeah. So we talked through the four mistakes and I want to end us on a really positive note. So instead of another mistake, I'd love to hear from both of you of what you see the biggest opportunity opportunity in employee storytelling right now. So Taylor, let's start with you. Yeah, I believe the biggest opportunity is to really humanize the brand of the company. And what that looks like is harnessing authentic experiences. Um, the companies are able to differentiate themselves in the market and ultimately build strong relationships with stakeholders and connect with their intended audiences. When I think of that, I think of stories like realistic job previews or day in the life videos, because we're really able to see both the challenges and the cool parts of someone's work day. And this not only helps attracting potential candidates and talents to the company, but it also helps us understand the depth of the role and fosters trust and boosts the morale of the company. I also think of brand advocacy, and that's another opportunity. Employees are often the most passionate advocates of the company. So by empowering them to share their stories on social media, blogs, or other platforms, organizations can really amplify their brand messaging in an authentic and organic way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that can look like employees sharing their own stories, or if they've been part of one of your employee storytelling projects, making sure that they have access to the stuff that they're in so that they can share it on their channels and be really proud of what they've been involved with. So great. Joel, what about you? What's an opportunity you're excited about? Yeah, I think mine's kind of similar to Taylor's. Uh, the biggest opportunity in employee storytelling right now is to really dive deep on the people behind your brand and then position them to be um, the main character with your company as a supporting character. 
So sometimes we get caught up in catchphrases and campaigns, but stories are really an opportunity to show concrete examples of how those things actually come to life. Um, focusing on the individual level first will help more people resonate and care about what you have to say. So then they'll stick around to hear more. And the Caterpillar example was a great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I we watched two minutes of it and Caterpillar wasn't said once. I mean, she was wearing a Caterpillar shirt. Eventually they get talked about. Um, but, you know, I think it also in the Davidson video, you know, she does a little bit of that too. Like it's more about a story about the people and like the experience they had. And like Davidson is the supporting character and like what's helped them have that great cultural moment. So I love all of that. And I think there's so much opportunity to do this and continue doing it well. So to recap the four mistakes that we shared, they were the first, not making content for your specific audience. So this idea of making it for everyone. So essentially it's for no one. So don't do that. Uh, the second was not identifying a creative direction before filming. The third was talking only in platitudes or testimonials. And I do want to go back a bit to that Davidson video because her first comment in the video is a bit of a platitude or testimonial. And it's like, it's kind of, that's the thing we hear a lot. It's all about the people, but her story really shared what that actually means there. So that's a great example of how can you use a platitude or testimonial and go much deeper. And then the fourth was not being flexible or open-minded with the way a project unfolds. So that was it. Thank you everyone for being here. We could obviously talk about this stuff all day long, but if you have questions or a project you're contemplating or just want someone to bounce ideas off of, please reach out. We love talking about employee storytelling and how to do this and bring it to life. And we also share other industry insights in a bi-weekly newsletter. So if you're not on that list and you want to be, Lauren's going to drop a link in the comments on where you can sign up. So thank you, Doyle and Taylor, for joining me today. I really appreciate your time and your thoughts. And we'll see you all back here in a few weeks. Thanks, Jill. Bye.